My name is Dr. Janet Kanodal. I'm a professor and an extension entomologist for NDSU. And I'd also like to acknowledge my coworker, Patrick Bose, research specialist for extension entomology. I'm gonna to talk today about two major sunflower insect pests, the red sunflower seed weevil and wireworms. Okay, uh, red uh, sunflower seed weevil is an annual economic insect pest of sunflower, especially in South Dakota and North Dakota. The larvae cause the damage by feeding internally on that developing kernel. They'll consume about a third of the kernel. When we have high economic populations, we can see 50 to 80% of the seeds infested causing significant yield loss and reduced oil quality. We use a combination of IPM methods for management, scouting using the economic threshold, and then a well-timed foliar insecticide for control. This is some information from the National Sunflower Survey that was conducted in 2021. Our red sunflower seed weevils are shown in the orange bar and you can see there was fairly significant seed feeding or damage in Kansas, uh, South Dakota, and North Dakota. The map over on the right side shows where those infestations were. You can see in North, uh, South Dakota, they occurred in the central area of the state. In North Dakota, it was the South Central, North Central, and Southwest. So we got a little bit concerned about what's going on with these red sunflower seed weevils and why the population is so large. So we wanted to do a glass vial bioassay to test these weevils for pyrethroid insecticide resistance. So we've been doing this for several years, but I'll talk mainly about the 2021 data. And we collected 24 locations in South Dakota and then 10 locations in North Dakota. And then we brought them back to the lab and let the beetles rest. And 24 hours later, we introduced 20 adults into the vials. And then we evaluated for weevil mortality at 24 and 48 hours. And in South Dakota, we're collaborating with Dr. Adam Varenhorst of South Dakota State University. So we tested seven treatments. The top one there, the acetone is the control or untreated. And then we had a high and low rate of Warrior, Asana, and Mustang Max. I'm only showing you a couple sites from South Dakota. They have a lot more data that I'm not showing, but I this is the mortality data. It's corrected mortality. So it's adjusted for the natural mortality that occurs in the control. And this particular location, I drew a line at 0.7 or 70% corrected mortality, because most growers don't want to see uh, less control than 70% mortality when they spray with insecticide. So here you can see both the high and low rate of Warrior 2 and Asana were above that 70% line. However, for Mustang backs, both the low and high rate, it, you know, they were below. We only saw about a 40% corrected mortality. Um, so that indicates some, something's going on at this site for just Mustang Max. And here's the second location. And you can see this is not, not, not as good as the previous slide. Uh, all of the insecticides, low and high rates, were below that 70% control. So there's something going on, and that's what we're trying to figure out, um, whether it's a development of insecticide resistance early on or not. So if we take a look at the last two years in South Dakota, we've seen an increase in the percent of locations with reduced susceptibility to red sunflower seed weevil. And that occurred for all the different chemistries that we tested. And it was the highest for uh, Warrior, the most significant increase. 
So there is something uh, going on and, and that's what we're trying to figure out with our research. Uh, for our results in North Dakota, we had 20 sites in 10 counties out in the South Central, North Central, Southwest, and then here in the Fargo area. However, we saw quite different results. Um, here's the 70% mortality line. And you can see we got close to 100% really for all the chemicals, low and high rate. And it's not uncommon when, you know, for insects when they're first developing tolerance or insecticide resistance to be very concentrated in certain locations like in South Dakota. Uh, so it's not surprising we saw this with soybean aphid where the populations early on that were resistant to pyrethroids were concentrated in South uh, West Minnesota. So we are seeing reduced susceptibility in some locations at South Dakota and we plan to continue this in 2022. In North Dakota, we're not seeing signs of reduced susceptibility to the tested pyrethroids. So there's a lot of reasons why this might be occurring and why we might see, see the development of maybe insecticide resistance. Well, we use airplanes for spraying sunflowers. So there might be some coverage problems, low water volume. And we had a severe drought both in South and North Dakota 2021. So there's increased water evaporation and maybe those insecticide droplets didn't reach the head very good in uh, 2021. Now we have a large weevil population right now. This has been increasing for over about five years. And the weevil is active as the adult for about a month. So they can easily reinfest those fields later in the season. And pyrethroid uh, residue is only about seven days after application. So and then there's also a lot of routine spraying just going on for seed weevils, especially in confection sunflowers, where most growers sign a contract and they're required to make two applications, early flowering, and then again, seven days later. So and then we have the EPA ruling on Chlorpheophos. And as you know, all tolerance have been revoked. And this will expire in February 28th, 2022. And this includes all use of chlorpyrifos, fluorospan, and generics in crop production. So please don't use it this upcoming year or in the future. There will be severe consequences if residues of chlorpyrifos is found on the seed. Um, and also the EPA is coming up with some guidance on what to do with all, like if your seed is treated with Lorsman or what to do with all the stocks. And I'm hoping that'll come out here at the end of February. I've been getting uh, quite a few questions on that. And I can't answer them yet because the EPA has not provided any guidance. So what are our alternatives for red sunflower seed weevil now that we lost Porphyophos? Well, mainly just our pyrethroids. Uh, we have quite a few different pyrethroids, um, and unfortunately, we might not see good control in some areas of South Dakota. We do have the carbonates, uh, 7XLR+, plus, but its seed weevils are not on the label. And then diamines, Prevathon, Vanticor, Elixiril, these are for the lepidopteran pests like cutworms, sunflower moth, banded sunflower moth, and grasshoppers. And it does not control seed weevils. We tested it. So we're kind of between a rock and a hard place right now for managing sunflower seed weevils at those sites that are seeing reduced um, control to, uh, with the pyrethroids. And then the EPA losing chlorpyrifos was a big lost for sunflowers because it was our alternatives for controlling weevils. And I guess I don't have any answers right now. What else to use? Get a section 18. We'll be testing a lot of different chemicals this upcoming year. So moving on to wireworms or in the family of Latter-day or click beetles. There's a lot of different species in North America 
But the main one we've seen at our North Dakota Mohall site is the prairie green wireworm. They have a long life cycle, three to five years, and most of it's spent in the soil as a larvae. And they overwinter deep in the soil profile, so they're protected from the cold. And as the soil temperatures warm up to 50, they'll start to move up towards the seeds that are planted. They'll chew on the seeds, the roots, and actually tunnel right into the plants themselves. And if conditions become dry or too hot, they move back down. And at the same time, the adults move, they prefer grassy crops and they'll lay eggs in the soil. And then this re repeats, they may be some late season feeding, but usually it's not economic. It's always the seedling stage that is the most susceptible. And then the mature wireworm larvae will pupate and transform into adults and they overwinter as larvae and adults in the soil, well protected. So they have a wide host range, but grasses are preferred and they love the small grains, corn, CRP. Crop damage is usually first noticed by gaps in the stand or just missing areas, um, blank spots. And uh, that's when you wanna get down on your hands and knees and dig around and look for wireworms. And they can also tunnel right into the sunflower. And this one's completely tunneled out on the inside and this poor seedling's trying to emerge, but it's going to die. Here's a, a couple plots where we ran some of our uh, trials. Here's the untreated check. You can see the stand. It's not very good and the weeds have moved in to fill up those vacant areas. And then the Mustang Max in furrow application, a good stand and also uh, very few weeds. So in our research, we use these uh, pots to sample for wireworms. We put untreated weed seed and verbiculite, water it well, put it down into the soil and cover it up with the saucer. And then we come back two weeks later and dissect that root mass and the plants and look for wireworms. They usually drop down to the bottom white plastic tub and then you can see them easier and count them. So we have a lot of different application technology for wireworms insecticide seed treatments has been our go-to over the last 10 years or so. And then we have in treatments at plant and then FMC has come out with Thrive Free Bee System. This is attached to your planter, as you can see in the picture, and it delivers the insecticide as a foam. One of the advantages of using this system is it eliminates the need for frequent refilling of water on the planter. One water filling in this canister here will go about 500 acres. So what do we have for insecticides? Well, we have the pyrethrites. Uh, Mustang Ant Max has been around for quite a few years and available in sunflower. We just got bifenthrin labeled and that includes capture and ethos. And then we've relied on these neonicotinoids for 15 years, imidacloprid, thiamethoxin, and then the diamines are a little bit newer, uh, but uh, they, primarily work the best on cutworms. So here's some data from our wireworm hot site in Mohal. And here I'm showing you some data with the Thrive system and capture at a low and high rate, and then a combination with the insecticide sea treatment cruiser in the capture Thrive. And here's our standard uh, cruiser insecticide sea treatment. So the blue is the plants per acre, and then the percentage sign is the percent um, stand loss or plant loss. So you can see the untreated check is significantly lower from all the treatments and didn't make any difference between the insecticide treatments. And we saw the same thing for yield. Yield was the lowest and untreated. And again, no difference in yield between all those different treatments. So there's no need to use a more expensive, higher rate or to stack uh, insecticide seed treatments with a Thrive. 
So here's some more data. Now, last year was a drought. Uh, so you'll see the difference here. Here's the untreated check. Here's our standard uh, Cruiser F, uh, 5 ff And again, you can see uh, that the insecticide C treatment did not work very well. Um, that's due to the drought because it needs moisture to wash that insecticide off and then absorbed by the roots and translocated throughout the plant to protect it from the wireworm feeding. And here we did ethos 3D and XB and capture, but again, you can see there was no differences uh, between the stand counts and the same with the uh, yield. And in fact, the yield on the seed treatment came back up and yield in uh, sunflowers due to many different factors and not only wireworms, so it's hard to say. But here's just looking overall at the different treatment types. There's perethroid inferral seed treatment and a combo and untreated. And as you can see, we didn't see a lot of differences again between the treatments, but they were always better than the untreated check or the bare seed. And the same thing uh, with the yield. So again, it's cheaper to use seed treatment or inferral, not to use a stacked uh, combo. So there is a new uh, chemistry that was available this past year in cereals from BESF, Roflaninib Group 30, and we're very excited about it. Uh, Terexa is the trade name, and it actually has mortality against the wireworms. It's not available in sunflowers yet. So some non-chemical controls is know your field. The wireworm has that long life cycle, so you're gonna have hot spots. Um, and there, that will be a hot spot for quite a few years. And then increase your seeding rate 10 to 15% in problem areas to compensate for wireworm stand loss. And then weed control, especially grasses. That makes it more attractive for the adult female beetle to lay eggs in, control those weeds. Then crop rotation, consider, you know, when you go out of sunflower and you go into wheat, Treat your wheat with Terexa. This kills the wireworms and will reduce the overall population. So when you come back to sunflowers, you'll hopefully have a lower population to deal with. So that's all I have. Thank you for your attention and hope you have a good day.